The following audio is from Shiloh Presbyterian Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. More information about Shiloh Presbyterian Church is available at shilohopc.org. So Job 1, 1 through 12. There was a man in the land of Oz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. The man had seven sons and three daughters. His possessions also were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. And that man was the greatest of all the men of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When the days of feasting had completed their cycle, Job would send and consecrate them, rising up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan, or the Satan also, came among them. The Lord said to the Satan, From where do you come? And then the Satan answered the Lord and said, From running about on the earth and walking around on it. The Lord said to the Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there's no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has. He will surely curse you to your face. Then the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Let us pray. We bless you, holy God in heaven, that you've given to us a word that's inspired by your spirit, that is sure and certain infallible, our only rule of faith and practice. And it's our prayer this morning that as we assemble before you now for preaching, that the Spirit who gave these words will illumine our understanding and grant they be, be preached in his power and that Christ to be lifted up. And you're seen, O trio and holy God, in all wisdom and power. We ask this for Christ's sake. Amen. Be seated. <clears throat> When you boys and girls go out in the yard to play, there are certain things that oftentimes uh, your mother will say, now, be careful. Just watch out for red ants. Don't stand on a red ant bed. Watch out for wasps and yellow jackets and bees. Watch out for thorn bushes. And, well, maybe watch out for snakes, too. Occasionally, we'll have a snake in our yard, although most of our snakes are not poisonous snakes. Uh, But... uh, In Uganda, if you went out to play, your mother would probably say, watch out for snakes, because there's lots of dangerous snakes in Uganda. In fact, there are 50 reported poisonous snake bites a week in Uganda, and in the bush, many are never reported, and many die from those snake bites. In fact, the missionaries carry their own anti-venom kits with them because of the great danger of poisonous snakes. Well, this morning, I'm going to talk to you about a snake. Not simply a snake in the grass, but uh, that serpent of old, as the Bible calls him. The one who not only could do harm to the body, but the one who can destroy the soul in hell forever. You know, we often don't think a great deal about Satan, do we? Now, 
the Apostle Paul assumed we would when he was writing to the Corinthians and explaining to them uh, the whole matter of church discipline. He said, uh, uh, I don't want you unaware, or don't, I know you're not unaware of the strategies of Satan. But can he say that about you today? Can he say that, well, I know that you're aware of the strategies of Satan. Many of us aren't. Many of us don't think much about Satan. Uh, if we do, we don't think much about uh, his role in the world or, or in our lives. And that's very dangerous. That's like being a child in Uganda, going out to play and not watching out for poisonous snakes. So as we come to this section this morning in Job chapter 1, verses 6 through 12, uh, what we have is probably the second and the most comprehensive account we have in Scripture in the Old Testament about Satan. We, we meet him under the guise of a serpent in Genesis chapter 3. But here in the unfolding of the history of redemption is the kind of full bore introduction to Satan. And we'll find some things about him in the New Testament. This is perhaps, though, these first two chapters, the most comprehensive biblical theological statement we have on Satan. Now, remember the background. A couple of months ago, we looked at the first five verses of Job. And we saw that God gives us description of Job as the background for what's going to take place in our two texts that we look at today. And then, in fact, Job is the model, the portrait of a very godly man, a person, so that he's described as blameless, upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. He was also a very useful man in his own day. He was very wealthy and very wise and very pious. He had a, a, a domestic piety. He had a social and civil piety. He used his position, his wealth, in his home, but in a society as large for the well-being. Now, in verse 6, the scene shifts, and we leave the land of us, and we actually enter into the courtroom of heaven, where the Holy Spirit is teaching us here that God uses His and our adversary in order to accomplish God's holy purposes. It's great comfort in that, if you'll stop and think about it. God uses His and our adversary in order to accomplish his holy purposes. And so we will have the um, adversary introduced, the challenge laid down, and permission granted. Well, first, let's meet the adversary in verses 6 and 7. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. Now, the number of things here that we learn about Satan in this very unusual scene. In the first place is he is a superhuman being. He's an angel. That's what is going on here. God is holding court and he's let us come in and we're kind of up in the balcony, and, and we're watching what's going on in court. And God uses his angels to patrol the earth and to uh, administer much of his providential care. They are uh, servants of, of the church. They are our protectors and keepers. And periodically, not that he needs to, but God brings them in to give an accounting of uh, their ministry, their stewardship that he has entrusted to them. And we see that as they come, that he also compels Satan, and right here he's called the Satan. It will become a personal name later in Scripture. But here he is, the Satan. He compels the Satan as well to come in. And Satan's presence there in the midst of angelic coast, just a very little insight as to his supernatural, superhuman nature. He is a spiritual being, he and his uh, myriads of demons, and he is a powerful uh, and very effective being. Second thing that we learn about Satan here is that he is the adversary, as I've already said, of God 
and his people. See, that's what the word the Satan means. He is the adversary. He's compelled in the presence of God. He's kind of lurking around in the back of the crowd. He'd rather not have to stand uh, before the Holy One uh, because he hates God. And he hates all of God's people and all of God's purposes. But he remains this uh, inveterate, uh, hate-filled adversary. The Apostle Paul says, for example, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 18, that he'd been thwarted from coming by Satan. That he, he puts out strategies and plans in order to, to thwart uh, the purposes in advance of the gospel. Now, there are other names given to us as well in Scripture about Satan, and we see one illustrated here in our text. That is the name, the devil. In uh, Revelation 12, he's called the uh, serpent of old, the dragon, Satan, and the devil. Now, the word devil means the slanderer. And Satan is the slanderer of God and of God's people. And we see that here in the text before us. He slanders Job. He says Job's a mercenary. He slanders God. He says no one would serve you because of who you are. We see, for example, in Zechariah, he slanders uh, the priest, uh, Joshua. Uh, he is the accuser. He is the slanderer of the people of God. And he, the fourth thing that we see about him, and he is a malevolent, malicious, absolutely evil being. As I said, he's kind of lurking. He really would rather not have to speak out. But God focuses the light on him, and God addresses him and says, Satan, where do you come from? Now, the answer is very evasive, kind of like he's been trekking. He's been hiking across the country. He says, oh, uh, walk, roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. Well, that's true. And the earth, in a sense, is his realm. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, he's the, the God of this world. In Ephesians 2, he is the, he's the God of the, of the air. Um, in the rebellion in the garden, uh, Satan was, uh, took over, so to speak, as an occupying force in this world. And so um, he's roaming about, but... He's doing so with absolute malice and evil. And so Satan, or Peter, tells us what he's doing when he's roaming about. Remember? Verse Peter 5. Like a lion seeking whom he may devour. Like a lion in the bush circling a herd of antelope looking for the opportunity to spring and kill. That's what he's doing as he's roaming about the earth. You need to understand the malice and the wickedness of Satan and the demons. There's no human being who is as evil as he or she could be. Not even a person like Hitler. Not even the head of ISIS. But Satan and the demons are moral black holes. There's no good. There's not the least bit of light in them. Satan and the demons are the personification of evil. You need to understand that. You need to understand his malice. You young people and teenagers need to understand the awful hatred of these beings. They come to you dangling bait. And that us, all of us, they are enticing us with the pleasures of sin. Why stick to these strict ways of holiness? Now, there's no fun there. And all the church and all others trying to do is curtail your pleasure. And he offers you pleasure, you boys and girls. It's like the white witch in Narnia with the truffle, uh, the, the candy that uh, appears so good and tastes so good. And then it becomes a bondage. And that's the malice of Satan. He hates you with an absolute hatred. The only thing he wants is to destroy your soul with him in hell forever. That's this being that we are introduced to. This is the adversary of God and his people. And we must be careful not to, over, to underestimate his power. 
He is a supernatural power being, powerful being who is full of black, evil, malice, and malevolence who's seeking only your misery and destruction. But on the other hand, do not overestimate his power either. He is a finite creature, but more importantly, he's under the thumb of God. And we see that throughout this passage. God compels him to the court. God compels him to give an answer. And as the text unfolds, we see that God is in absolute control. But also let me remind you where we are in the unfolding of the history of redemption this morning. Because it appears that in the Old Covenant that Satan had even more access uh, into the throne room than he has now. Because of the ministry, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the defeat of Satan has begun. And he does not roam as freely, and he does not have the same kind of access, it seems, to God. Remember what Jesus said when the the 70 came back from their preaching mission. In Luke chapter 10, he said, I saw Satan under their preaching and casting out demons. I saw Satan falling from heaven. And then in John chapter 12, verse 31, when he says in verse 30, the Son of Man is lifted up, he draws all men to himself, and that's a double entendre, a double meaning word. Yes, lifted up on the cross, but also lifted up in our preaching. And then he says in verse 31 that Satan has been cast down. And in chapter 16 of John, he says that he has been judged. And so we get to Revelation in chapter 12, chapter to which I have already alluded. We see that he is, in a sense, cast out of heaven. Verse 7, there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who's called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation has come. And so... Today, as we sit here, he is in a prison of sorts. We're told in Revelation 20 that he is on a long chain. He's bound for this whole church age in which we live from the ascension of Christ until shortly before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that binding means in particular he can no longer deceive the nations. They belong to Christ. And Christ is gathering his elect from the ends of the earth and he's growing his kingdom. Um, It doesn't mean that he has been completely conquered. He has been defeated. And the death blow was dealt in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's manifested, but the final defeat will come at the end of the age. We can think of the comparison of World War II. Uh, Normandy with D-Day in June of of, uh, 1944 brought, in a sense, the defeat of the Axis. But it was almost a year later, in May of 1945, I think it was May 8th, that Germany surrendered. The first was D-Day, the defeat, but V-Day, the final victory, took place a year later. In Christ's resurrection ascension is our D-Day. He's under the foot of Christ, and Christ has been given authority over all the nations of the earth, but that final Victory shall come when the trump sounds and the shout of the archangel and our Lord descends from heaven. And we look forward to that day when he shall be completely with all of his evil and all of his minions, all the demons locked up in hell forevermore. But you understand this morning that if you're not trusting Christ, you're going to be locked up with him. Awful, malicious beings. That would make hell as bad as we think it could be. But that's just the beginning. Because if we're locked up with him in hell, we then are being punished with him by God in hell. And not for some brief period of time, but for endless ages 
millennium upon millennium. So this is your adversary. Second thing we see is the challenge that is laid down. Now, I don't know about you, but I find this to be one of the most interesting things in Scripture. You would think when God tells Satan, come here, that Satan would be immediately ready to attack and challenge Job. But who is it that lays down the challenge? Do you understand this? It's not Satan. It's God. God's taunting. He's flaunting. And so God says to him, have you considered my servant Job? In verse 8, there's no one like him on the earth. And now God gives his commendation, a blameless and upright man fearing God and turning away from evil. You see that God is provoking? Sometimes you boys and girls will get in an argument with your brother and sister and one of you has provoked the other one. The other one rises quickly to the provocation. And usually in those cases, the one who provokes is the one who has the more serious blame. But notice, this is the holy God who is provoking. Because you see, he knows. He knows when he sets this godly man in front of Satan exactly the response that Satan is going to have. And that is the response that God wanted. Okay? It's deep water. But walk with me through it. Because this is biblical truth. God put no evil thoughts into the mind of Satan. God in no way sought to entice Satan in a wicked manner to sin. And God never does. He's of eyes too pure to look upon sin with any favor. But God threw the bait on the water, knowing full well that when he dangled the bait, when it floated in the water, that Satan would rise like a big trout and take it. And that was God's intention. God's intention. You see, it was God's eternal purpose that Satan attack Job. That God might make Job both a type of the Lord Jesus Christ and a manifestation of his own mercy, grace, and goodness. And that's how this relationship operates in Scripture. God has foreordained whatsoever comes to pass. Don't back away from that truth because if you do, life is miserable. And God uses Satan and demons and and wicked and sinful people to accomplish holy and good purposes. He doesn't put the purpose in their mind. He doesn't uh, drive them or compel them to do it. He does sustain their being and ability to operate. And he has foreordained what they will do, although they are freely doing it. And that's a mystery. And yet the Bible is very clear about that. Is there any clearer place than what Peter says about the murder of the Lord Jesus Christ? They were guilty. They murdered him. But it was according to the foreknowledge and uh, predetermined plan of God. Now, this interaction that is revealed here in Job 1 helps us understand um, another interaction that we find in 1 Kings uh, chapter uh, 22 where God wants to destroy Ahab. And so Ahab wants to go into battle, and he calls for uh, Micaiah, or Jehoshaphat asks for a true prophet. And Micaiah says in verse 19, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right and his left. The Lord said, Who will entice Ahab to go up and follow at Ramoth Gilead? So once again, the Lord puts that on the table. A spirit came forward and stood, well, they gave different answers, and then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. The Lord said, how? I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And then he said, you are to entice him and prevail. Now, you see, it wasn't God's idea, but God said that he would sustain him in that purpose 
and he would prevail. Go and do so. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all these your prophets, and the Lord has proclaimed disaster against you. So when we talk about the permission or the permissive will of God, we're not saying that God looked and saw the certain awful things would occur and said, okay, I'll let that happen. No, we're saying that God has foreordained all that comes to pass, but with respect to the second causes, the immediate agents, he permits them to do that which they sinfully, willfully desire to do. And they are fulfilling holy purposes that are always for holy and good ends. It's the great divine alchemy of the sovereign and triune God. He turns not simply base metal to gold. He turns all evil and sin that enters the lives of his people to good and accomplishes all things perfectly well. We see then that the permission is granted in the last part of our text. Satan uh, answers the challenge with this mockery, and here is the um, slander. Verse 9, does God, Job, fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him and his house, all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands, and possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has, he will surely curse you to your face. So Job says, God said, Satan says to God, Job's simply a mercenary. He's not a pious man. He does this for what he gets. And uh, moreover, God, you're, you're no better than a rice missionary. You have purchased his allegiance. And so uh, Satan ignores the character of Job, and he simply says that you put a hedge about him and his house, You've blessed the work of his hands. His possessions have increased. You've just bought him. And you see what he's saying? He says there's no one who would love God because of who and what he is. Thought about that question yourself. Why do you love God? Comfortable life? We live in very blessed circumstances, don't we? Uh, what would happen if we're all taken away? You had to either c- confess God and lose everything, or if you want to keep everything, oh, simply just deny Him. My wife and I in God's providence have come to that time of life where we live very comfortably, as many of you. But that causes me to think often, am I ready? Am I ready to walk away from all of this if it were a matter of the honor and glory of Christ? Are you? Would Satan be right if he said that about you today? That you only love God and you only serve God. You're only a part of God's people because of what is in it for you in this life. We must learn the matter of Christian contentment. And our response needs to be the response in that beautiful song of Habakkuk at the end when he's wrestled with the evil of the Babylonians being used to destroy the less evil of God's covenant people. And he concludes his book with this song. And he sings, um, verse 17, Though the fig tree should not blossom and there be no fruit on the vines, though the, the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls. In other words, you lose everything. Yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. Is that your testimony today? That the Lord is your portion and delight. And everything else, as Calvin would say, you kind of hold to it like a hot potato, a loose grip ready to drop everything for the sake of Christ and his glory. Well, that's what Satan said that Job wouldn't do. He said, let me have him, and he will deny you. 
And here we see then that God grants the permission, because it was God's holy will, that Job be challenged in this manner. But even here, God shows his sovereignty. Now you see, you know, Satan is, is much better theologian than all the evangelicals around us. He recognized the sovereignty of God. He knew he couldn't do a thing without God's permission. But also God put up the fences, you see. So God said, okay, you can have at him, but you don't touch his life. And so God continued to put a fence around Job. And Satan then went away from the interview gloating because God said, he is in your power only do not put forth your hand on him. And so here this text unfolds for us this great uh, mystery of um, the relationship of God's holy purposes and uh, his purpose of trials in our lives and summed up so beautifully well in the stanza and how firm uh, foundation on page 600 uh, and uh, uh, page 94. When through fiery trials your pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be your supply. The flame shall not hurt you. I only design your dross to consume and your gold to refine. That's what's going on here, you see. Satan had malicious and evil purposes. And God had holy and good purposes. And there appears to be a clash. But there is no clash. You see, God's purposes are at work in Job. To make him even more holy and godly. To lift him up as an example of God's grace. And as that pattern of patient endurance to which James refers in James chapter 5. The beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's God's purpose. And it's God's purpose in every trial that you undergo. You see, God takes the adversary's evil and accomplishes his purposes with it. So you've met the adversary, and I trust you've got more sober thoughts about him and his demons. But I trust that you also see now that uh, the challenge is always in the hand of the Lord, whether Satan comes as the accuser or not. God is in control, <clears throat> and God's permission must be granted. You, most of us read about the Iron Dome, Dome in Israel. It's quite remarkable, this missile shield that... Um, Less than 10% of the, uh, of the missiles from, from Gaza get through. Well, God has an iron dome. And it's not just 90% effective. Not one trial, not one fiery dart comes through apart from God's sovereign, wise, and good pleasure. Do you believe that? Many of you have suffered in many different ways. You've suffered marriage problems. You've suffered health problems. You've had work problems. You've suffered corporately and gone through trials as a congregation. Can you say this morning with the Apostle Paul that all things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose? See, that's what lies here in this text of Scripture. This is the great truth of Scripture. God is in absolute control, and he's a holy and loving God, not just an omnipotent. And powerful God. He's a wise God. He knows exactly what he's doing. And he designed each life. So yes, we're going to have the attacks of Satan. And we'll talk about those uh, this evening by God's grace. But rest. Rest in the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has defeated Satan. And he is your Lord and Savior. And he says that your foot is on Satan's neck. And that he who is in you is more powerful than the one who is in the world. And so cling to Christ and rest to Christ. And of course that brings me to ask 
each of you this morning, are you sure that you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? You, you see who the enemy is. Don't be naive like our president with ISIS. This is no junior varsity evil. It's not an evil that you can contain. You can't defeat it or him. But Christ has. And your only release from the death grip, the grimy claws of Satan, is right now to repent of your sin and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't sit here and think, well, I'll think about that. Some of you teenagers, I'll think about that. No. Because that means that you've taken a revolver with one cartridge in a chamber and you've twisted it and you've put it to your head and you pull the trigger. How do you know that that's not the chamber that has the cartridge? You're playing spiritual reset, roulette to say, I'll think about that. The Bible says today is a day of salvation, not tomorrow. If you understand anything this morning about the malice and evil of Satan, about your sin, about your danger, then right now, Repent of your sins and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our God in heaven, we bless you and thank you for uh, your message to us, the assurance of grace that comes to us. We thank you that you are the all-powerful and sovereign God. We thank you that you take great delight in your people. And we thank you for Christ. We pray, Lord, that all who are here today will be resting in him. And that we can do so with hope and confidence that he has overcome. We pray that you will thwart the purposes of the evil one. And you will overthrow his evil as he persecutes your church. And that you will protect your people under the ends of the earth. But above all, we know you accomplish sovereign and good purposes. And we pray these things for Christ's sake. Amen.